Good morning, Chicago. I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. And as always, on Tuesday mornings, we're here to answer your public health questions, give you some updates, tell you what's happening uh, with COVID and monkeypox and other things of public health interest in Chicago. We've got a guest today. Uh, some of you who have been following along may recognize him. This is Dr. Isaac Ganai. Uh, he is one of our medical directors at the Chicago Department of Public Health. And he's over our lab-based surveillance, our wastewater work, and a lot of you continue to have questions about variants and what are we doing with wastewater and how are we monitoring that going forward. So um, thank you, Isaac, for joining today. Uh, tell folks just a little bit about what you and your team are kind of working on these days so folks have a sense. Sure, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So as Alison said, my name is Dr. Isaac Ginai. I'm the medical director for the laboratory-based surveillance program. Um, and we really do three things in the lab-based surveillance program. We have a diagnostic testing team. So this is a team that with COVID, for example, we send them to skilled nursing facilities, to homeless shelters, to jails. Make sure people can get tested. Exactly, mm -hmm. especially when there's a case or a possible outbreak in a facility, one of these congregate settings where we really saw spread happening very quickly for COVID. But we also do other things for diagnostic testing. So we were involved a lot with the facilitating monkeypox diagnostic testing very yep. early on, for example, when it was all through public health laboratories. So that's the diagnostic testing side. And then we also have two big arms of molecular surveillance. Yep. So molecular surveillance is kind of not looking at uh, diagnostics where we're looking for one person's test result. We're really trying to survey the whole population and monitor everybody at the same time. And the two big programs we have here are genomic surveillance, where we look for variants for COVID-19, for example. But Collect also samples all over the city and then see what the variants are, basically. Exactly. And that works for COVID, where we've really you know, drilled down into variants. And, and everybody's aware of some of the names like Omicron and Alpha and mm -hmm. Delta. Um, mm -hmm. But it also is probably important for other pathogens. And we're planning to expand that genomic surveillance to other pathogens to use them in outbreak response and to understand what what lineages of flu are circulating in a yep. given year and, and things like that. And then the third aim that I think we're gonna talk a bit more about today is, is our wastewater surveillance program. So this is where we monitor and test sewage basically from across the city to try to understand by testing that sewage what we can learn about everybody who lives in that catchment area's general health state. So we test for example for COVID and we can try and understand all of those people whose sewage is flowing into the pipe that we sampled how much COVID is there there compared to the last week or the week before? Right. So those are the three big things that we do in the lab-based surveillance program. Perfect. And that's because, you know, as opposed to waiting for people to come in to get a test on an individual level, we continue to collect all of the positive tests for not just COVID, but about 77 infectious diseases um, across the city. Every time there's a positive test, the health department receives that information, does the investigation, looks to see is there an outbreak. It's the same approach broadly for a foodborne outbreak or when we're looking at sexually transmitted infections as it is here. Um, but the nice thing about wastewater is you don't have to wait for people to come in and get a test um, because if you have COVID right now, we can see that in, in your poop, basically. Uh, and that is a way at a population level to understand what's happening. But I want you to know that Isaac's entire job, all of this work, none of it existed before COVID at the health department. We certainly did case investigation. If we needed to do some of that higher level um, genomic surveillance, variants, that kinds of things, it all had to get sent down to CDC. Um, we'd, we'd wanted to have wastewater surveillance in place, but hadn't had the resources. So this is really one of the areas that we have grown the most during COVID uh, with some of that new federal funding. And it's where public health is going, I think, frankly. So um, feel free to put in your questions um, for Isaac or for me. Um, we're going to turn now, I'll, I'll show you just a couple of websites and dashboards like we always do. And then we've got some slides to do some broad updates. Isaac will end there with some uh, wastewater, just high level again, some, some pictures, because I think pictures are important. And then um, in the latter part, we will get directly into your questions. You can put your questions directly into the box below. You can also use the hashtag AskDrArwady on either Facebook or Twitter.
So as always, let's start with some dashboards and some websites. So first of all, we'll pull up the COVID dashboard. We've been showing this to you every single time we've done Facebook for two years now. Uh, Chai.gov slash COVID dash. And you see a lot of green on here. Um, our cases are down a bit from last week. Our hospitalizations are down a bit from last week. Our deaths are down a bit. Um, our vaccinations are up uh, because of boosters, right? The, the, the new booster. And I know people will have questions about that. But if we zoom in here, you can really see you know this nice shooting up already and thanks to all the people who have right away gone and gotten your updated COVID vaccine that is what we want you to do because the match is so good and we'll certainly talk more about that um, but the vaccine numbers are looking good our emergency department visits look good about two percent one point nine percent of um, everybody who's coming to an emergency department about one in 50 people in Chicago right now have a COVID diagnosis and then if we look at hospital beds it remains in the sort of four to four point five percent range um, but if you put that into numbers, it does mean one in 25 beds, um, hospital beds in Chicago are taken up with somebody who has a positive COVID test. So where people are thinking, oh, COVID's done, COVID's mm -hmm. gone, um, that's really not true, but it is in good control. And as long as people are up to date with their vaccines, including getting this updated uh, booster that's available now, that helps us um, protect the healthcare system and individual Chicagoans. We also continue to get questions about Chicago Public Schools and COVID. And if you just go to cps.edu, I want to show you that they've really been making some nice updates to their site. If you want to learn about getting vaccinated through Chicago Public Schools, you can click here. If you want to learn about testing, CPS continues to offer screening testing uh, free for staff and students, which is more actually than what the CDC recommends. But um, they've worked hard to make sure there are resources available. There also are at-home tests that are distributed through school. Um, if you want to see what's happening with COVID data, and CPS, you, you can go to tracking COVID-19. And then if you want to know more about resources. So I encourage you, if you have CPS questions, to take a look there. I also just wanted to remind you that we have um, a, a data dashboard for monkeypox. So chicago.gov slash MPV or monkeypox will get you there. Um, and you get a sense here, and we'll, sh we'll show these in a minute, but we've had, we're getting close to a thousand cases um, of MPV just here in Chicago residents. And I think, you know, probably within the next week or so, we will cross that thousand um, mark. And we've had 59 hospitalizations along that, no deaths. And you can see that we have seen a, a nice drop off in terms of new cases, but it is definitely not gone. And we're going to talk a little bit about the demographics of that in just a second. So, um, you know, we have about the same number of MPV cases being diagnosed every day right now as we did in early July. So, and it's worth, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just worth saying with monkeypox, I think, as with many, um, many infectious diseases when we see an outbreak like this, there's often this kind of long tail and the yes. leveling off at the end. And so I think there's early signs that that's maybe where we're heading. And so it's very much not over. And there may very be much not. many more infections to come if we're not vigilant. That's right. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight that if you could just Google Chicago wastewater or get to it off of our COVID site. But we do have a whole page here about wastewater surveillance. So, you know, we'll talk about it today. But if you want to read more or click on things or see maps or look at reports, um, the team really every month or so is doing a big update here. So um, just want you to know that there's lots more information. So let's turn to some of the slides. So first, a couple things we're excited about outside the infectious disease space, or outside the outbreak space anyway. Today marks the one year anniversary of launching our CARE program. That's our Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement Program. This is the first time the city of Chicago has embedded mental health professionals in its 911 call response. Uh, so when Chicagoans call 911 and they have a mental health issue, first and foremost, it's a joint program between the, the health department, the fire department that provides paramedics, um, OEMC, the Office of Emergency Management and, and Coordination, which does uh, the 911 calls and triage, and then finally uh, the Chicago Police Department. And so these are the vans. Um, now we've had a lot of upgrades and we're operating um, both versions of the care program that have this uh, multidisciplinary response where there's a paramedic and a CDPH mental health clinician and uh, a, a trained 
trained um, CPD officer if there are concerns about violence, et cetera. We also have a version called alternate response that does not include a police officer. And uh, we're operating in, in three geographic areas of the city right now, really as we move into year two, I'm looking to expand that. Next, we'll be um, working on a substance use focused version of this for the west side uh, and then continuing, you know, the plan is to grow some additional shifts and probably some additional areas. So super excited about this. It's been a big lift. We have a dashboard for this too, if you want to see what the numbers are like. But, you know, the team has had um, something around 350 uh, initial interactions in that first year, and that's been growing. Um, and then another 300 or so follow on appointments um, and, and, and checking back with folks. And really, really a new way of thinking about mental health crises here in the city. And we're really proud of it. So congrats to everybody um, working on the CARE program on the one year anniversary. I also wanted to highlight that we've continued to hold these fentanyl test kit builds um, and overdose education events. Uh, these are some pictures from one last week. Uh, this was in collaboration with Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council. But just as a quick reminder, fentanyl, um, that's that really strong opioid, 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin or morphine. It is contaminating a lot of substances, non-prescription pills, cocaine. Um, sometimes people are buying things on the internet and they don't know it has this strong opioid in it. And we're seeing people overdose and even die. Um, and so to be safer, we recommend using these fentanyl test strips to basically test any substance um, for fentanyl before you use it. So if you wanna request kits or you wanna get involved, you can, you can email at that address there. Um, but we really, lots of good harm reduction substance use work happening across the city. And then finally, I wanted to highlight that just yesterday, the um, CDC has updated um, and had did an issue brief about this idea of status neutral HIV care. And the way we have normally thought about HIV care, as soon as somebody is diagnosed with HIV, historically, they get a lot of resources um, because making sure that someone who has HIV is in medical care and on medications um, can cut almost to zero the chance that they will spread HIV. And we work to make sure people with HIV are supported on housing and supported on what other needs they have. But if you're thinking about prevention, you'd really w rather not wait for somebody to be diagnosed with HIV. There are medications that people who are high risk for HIV can take before getting infected called PrEP. Um, there are people who are at high risk. And so this idea of status neutral work has been emerging in the US. And Chicago was actually just featured in this brief. There's a link there um, because we have restructured our whole HIV services portfolio over the last couple of years with this uh, um, status neutral approach. So working with lots of community members, um, lots and lots of engagement, but we have now integrated all of our HIV and sexually transmitted infection funding. It lets us more comprehensively link people to the services that they need. STI screening, MPV vaccination, substance use disorder treatment, mental health, housing, financial assistance, etc. cetera. Um, and the way we've got this set up, you, it, it's not that folks have to be diagnosed with HIV to access the services. We've worked in used a little bit of city funding actually where the where the federal funding has not been available to make sure that those at highest risk um, can also be supported in staying HIV negative so just you know wanted to very quickly highlight that um, we're really proud of that it's a it's a space that Chicago has been leading in um, and I would refer you to that brief if you want to learn more about it Okay, now we'll move into our traditional um, infectious disease update so quickly on monkeypox first this time. The outbreak does continue to grow around the world. We're at almost 58,000 total confirmed cases in now 103 countries. And if you look at this map, those blue dots show you the countries that historically had, had monkeypox, usually from um, exposure to forest animals. Um, whereas now, everywhere in orange, that's the current outbreak where we instead have seen much more human-to-human -human transmission. And that has definitely continued to grow. We remain concerned as a health department that while in the US we have pretty good now access to vaccines and treatment, um, that that is not true internationally. And um, I do think you know this, this outbreak is, is likely to continue for, for some time. Uh, in the US, we have about 23,000 of those cases. We have had the most cases diagnosed of any country. We also have a lot more testing available than some countries. There have been cases in every state um, you can see Illinois has uh, um, about 1,140 of those cases uh, and Chicago 940 of the 1,100 or so in Illinois. 
If you look at the CDC numbers, we are um, seeing some decline, just like we are here in Chicago. You see that there was one day with a lot of reporting in, that's after the three-day um, uh, Labor Day, yeah. thank you, uh, break, um, but, but still a lot of cases. And my concern is if people are not getting tested, you'll miss them. I wanted to also highlight that we've seen major behavioral change here. And I really want to highlight this um, because a lot of folks who are at highest risk for MPV have reported in the short term changing some of those behaviors. Uh, this was a big internet study that CDC did in August, um, and we saw about a 50% decrease um, in terms of people reporting, uh, men reporting a reduced number of sex partners, reduced one-time sexual encounters, um, and, and reducing sex with partners met on dating apps. Given that this continues to really be predominantly in um, the gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men population, this is major behavioral change. So this is driving that decrease clearly as much or even more than vaccine is. And behavioral change usually is less persistent. Um, and so getting folks vaccinated is, is critical. We've, we now have seen cases in 67 of Chicago's 77 community areas. Um, and this is the... the, the um, graph I showed you off the website. The good news is we're seeing this decrease, but we're seeing some of those demographics change. We are now seeing a higher proportion of cases in black Chicagoans in particular, and I want to show you that data. So if you look at the, the data overall, you can see um, about 25% of our cases overall have been in black Chicagoans, compared to about 31% in Latino, 39% in white non-Latino, and still 94% of Chicagoans that report their sexual orientation um, report being gay or bisexual. You can dive into this in more detail online. But where we look week over week, we are seeing some of that race ethnicity shift. So um, if you've been following along with us for years, we always use the same colors for race ethnicity. So red represents white non-Latinx Chicagoans, blue Latinx Chicagoans, purple black non-Latinx Chicagoans, and green Asian non-Latinx as people self-report. And so you see that early on, um, each of these vertical bars represents a week. So early on, we had a low number of cases, but predominantly in red here, predominantly in white non-Latinx Chicagoans. Um, and then we've seen a pretty consistent um, percentage of Lat Latino Chicagoans, but in purple here, increasing to a point where in the last couple of weeks, about half of our cases have actually been among black Chicagoans. Um, and so, you know, needing to make sure that people are understanding that risk um, and, uh, and getting vaccinated. We are still seeing some some disproportionate uptake of vaccine. We're working on um, how do we improve that access? How do we improve confidence in the vaccine? But you know, about 31% of our MPV cases have been la in Latino Chicagoans, but only about 18% of the vaccines at this point have gone to Latino Chicagoans and about 25% of cases in black Chicagoans, but about 13% um, of vaccines to black Chicagoans. And so you know, this remains a significant focus. We're doing a lot of um, events and outreach and working with trusted providers but uh, we really do need help. So please talk about this. Talk about the fact that we are seeing some disparities. We've got vaccine available um, for everybody who's eligible. We are seeing more people get their second dose, which is good. So uh, this is just showing just Chicago data. There have been about 32,000 um, MPV vaccines at this point, about 25,000 of those first dose, and then about a quarter of those people have had their second dose already. You should get two doses of, va of a vaccine. Like everybody who got their first dose, you should get a second dose. It needs to be at least 28 days later. And so red here is showing people who have gotten their second vaccine. Um, and we would expect more and more people, um, you know, to come up to date with their, with their second vaccine. So just a reminder, um, two doses of the Genios vaccine is the recommendation uh, to be considered up to date. And um, we, we've got some demographics here about who's getting vaccinated. Um, we've had zero MPV cases in children. We've had only two children receive an MPV vaccine. That would be if, for example, you're a household contact, a close household contact of somebody um, who's diagnosed with MPV. So um, you can take a look at this in some more detail if you're interested. We'll be getting some more vaccination data on the public website too. Um, and I just wanted to highlight on the bottom here, we've largely switched over to this. Um, that The green shows the vaccines in Chicago that were given um, subcutaneous, uh, which is the way we were originally giving the MPV vaccines. And then the blue is as we've moved to that intradermal, that shallower vaccine that lets us um, vaccinate more people. So you can see the great majority of vaccines now in Chicago are using that other method. 
Um, and we're seeing an excellent match on race ethnicity for our MPV cases. Um, not as good for vaccine at this point, but excellent for treatment, TPOX treatment. Remember, there is treatment for MPV and antiviral and um, people who are at higher risk for severe infection or having bad symptoms, getting hospitalized, we definitely want those folks to get treated. So you can see that um, the race ethnicity breakdown is actually very good, which lets us know that black and Latino Chicagoans are accessing care um, and able to get treatment, but um, still a ways to go on, on, on working on those vaccine gaps. Uh, so in case you missed it, eligibility for the MPV vaccine in Chicago and Illinois, all sexually active gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men, all sexually active transgender persons. So please get this vaccine. Second dose registration is open and we have plenty of appointments available. Six days a week, CDPH has appointments um, at our clinics in Lakeview, Austin, and Roseland. And you can register at getvaxchai.chicago.gov. Um, and with any questions, you can call our hotline. All right, let's do COVID. Uh, we'll finish with MPV and then we'll, then we'll take your questions and talk, uh, talk surveillance for the second half of the conversation. Very quickly on COVID, we actually are seeing some decreases around the world in terms of cases. Uh, remember the darkest purple is usually where we're seeing the most. So Eastern Europe right now um, having the most cases per population, um, but uh, overall things are cooling off a little bit, which is good. I think a lot of this, and please chime in on any of this, is because um, you know we've, we've seen this BA4-5 be relatively consistent now for a number of weeks, um, but we have, I always like to point out, administered more than 12.3 billion vaccine doses, which is amazing. Um, we've got safe and effective vaccines, but in contrast, we've had more than six and a half million recorded deaths um, and likely more than that um, around the world. If we look at the U.S., um, remember the darkest again shows where we're seeing more cases. Appalachia continues to be the area of the country that right now is, is surging the most, but even there, uh, in relatively not seeing any major problems. Chicago continues to have um, a, a formal case case per population that's a little lower than the national average and a little lower than the state of Illinois. And this is the good news, that um, when CDC updated, they update on Thursday nights, 57% now of U.S. counties are high, uh, shown in orange in the map, or medium, shown in yellow in the map. Um, and that's down. It's been dropping each week. 68% um, of counties were, were elevated a week ago. So Chicago and really northeastern Illinois remains in that yellow medium level. Um, and you can see there, too, you know, Appalachia is all orange. And that's really where the most notable um, local surge is right now. So here, just as a reminder, um, our CDC risk is considered medium. That's both because our cases per 100,000 population, both for the city of Chicago and for Cook County, are under 200 over the last seven days in that left column. And our new admissions, um, in Chicago at least, are less than 10, and Cook County is just a little over 10. So, uh, you know, we follow this every week. Um, remember, when it's medium, we recommend having the mask on indoors. Uh, when we move to high is when we really strongly recommend um, adding additional mitigation um, at the population level. Please put your mask on, especially if you're on the L. Um, I take the L every day, and most people continue to wear masks, and, and we appreciate that. Why don't you maybe take the variant surveillance just to hand it over for a minute and I'll pick it back up. Sure, yeah. So the, I think the first thing to say is that this is a really great chart that is on the CDC website and updated every week. Um, and really since for the entirety of this year so far, pretty much everything has been Omicron. Yep. Omicron is one of the variants of concern. And uh, when you split up Omicron into its sublineages, you can see a little bit more change. But the good news again here is that even with the sublineages and that split, that kind of subdivided Omicron, it's still been relatively stable for the last few weeks and months. And the really good news here is related to vaccine boosters, which I imagine you're gonna talk about in a second, um, but BA4 and 5 is really the ingredients of this updated COVID booster. Exactly. And so um, the fact that those have been circulating for a while is what's enabled the vaccine to be developed. And the fact that they're still dominant is really a good indication that they're going to provide excellent protection as we go into the fall and winter. Um, so good news that there's relative stability here. 
We like to monitor locally the speed at which the variants are changing, and that's a good indication of if something is coming up really fast, that's probably a concerning variant. And there's nothing like that on the horizon right now. Right. So really good signs of stability here and a good indicator that the vaccine is going to offer good protection in the fall and winter. Yeah, so every week, you know, Isaac and his team sort of create a low, medium, or high for variant risk too. And because we're right now not seeing a new scary variant emerging and things have been relatively stable, we are considered at lower, you know, lower risk. Right. Um, for variants. And actually, that's the very first time that we've been at that level for a long time. Yes. Because, you know, in late 2021, we, it was high risk with Omicron coming up. We've had lots of medium risk with lots of these other sublineages increasing in prevalence. Yep. But really, we've been relatively stable for a good period of time now. Yep. And the colors here, of course, uh, just if folks aren't usually on, represent the different sublineages. So you can see almost everything is that green. That's BA5. And still, BA4 and BA5, 99% approximately of all of the cases we're seeing. Um, and that is a beautiful match for the updated COVID vaccine. And so that's why we need folks to get that updated COVID vaccine now. Not wait three months, four months, five months, because right now is when the match is excellent. Yeah, and there's also, there's also no guarantee. You know, we constantly monitor these new variants, but there's no guarantee that this is going to stay stable forever. So again, right. even more imperative to get that vaccine right now. Right. This just shows similar data, but looking at the different regions of the country. We have seen at different times in the pandemic that there's been more variety across different areas of the US. Um, so I think back to um, 2021, and uh, we had more gamma than some other areas of the mm -hmm. state. And sometimes that's just kind of random chance. But right now you can see just by looking at all of those clocks, again, the colors represent the different variants and the slices of the pie is how much there is of each. Um, but it's really similar across the country and really BA5 predominates with BA4 making up and its sublinges making up the rest of the pie. Yep, match couldn't be better right now. Yeah, and this is another variant slide. This is one that we produce locally in partnership with our Regional Innovative Public Health Laboratory, or RIPPLE, which is a partnership with Rush University Academic Medical Center. So we, as the Chicago Department of Public Health, collaborate with hospitals around the city. They send in samples every week to RIPPLE, the RIPPLE lab at Rush, and our colleagues there um, conduct a couple of different types of analysis. One is a special type of PCR analysis, or polymerase chain reaction, um, which tells us the likely lineage very quickly. It doesn't tell us the definitive lineage, but it tells us the likely lineage. And that's what we use to make this plot. And this plot looks at the different, um, at the kind of, the, the speed at which different variants are coming up. So I talked a little bit about how when you see a rapid increase like this. That purple. That purple, mm -hmm. that's Omicron BA1, and the one from like November, December 2021. And this is and the it wheat. shot up so fast, which is why we had this enormous surge and you know concerns about overwhelming the health system. And 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 when when we see a variant emerge like that, it means it's more competitive. It's outcompeting everything else, uh, more contagious. Um, so the faster it's rising, the more we're concerned about it. Absolutely. And you can see here, this is the on the x-axis or the horizontal axis here. You can see this is the number of weeks it took after it crossed one, causing one percent of cases to you know, cause nearly 100% of cases. And for Omicron BA1, it was a really short amount of time. It's just a few weeks from our first detection to it nearly being every single one of our cases. Now, with uh, some of them kind of, and then we've drawn a line approximately here to, you know, this is a kind of guess, this is a gestalt, to say on the left of that line is really worrying, on the right of that line is just a little bit worrying. And you can see, again, the colors are the same as they were before, but BA4 and BA5 are these kind of um, tealy, um, sea foamy green colors. And they're really in line with many of these other Omicron sublineages. They've come up much, much, much slower than the original Omicron BA1. Again, an indication of less concern than the original Omicron BA1. Um, and so, that, so those kind of fall in with the rest of the bunch of the pack. And so we continue to monitor these, but there's nothing we're not seeing any sh anything shooting up here. We're not seeing yep. anything arise. So pretty stable picture and, from variant. And behind the scenes, just so you know, this is some of the data we are looking at the most closely. Like this is more when we're trying to predict the future and see what's happening. This is actually more important than the number of cases getting formally diagnosed because many people are having home tests, et cetera. Um, but it's an example of what we're looking at population level behind the curve. Right. This is similar data to the, um, to the, this uses some of those CDC data, those charts that we looked at before. Again, the colors are the same. They represent the different variants. And you can see BA4 four and 5 here in this kind of um, tealy green. But the um, height of the bars here 
represents the number of cases in Chicago. So um, this is a, what we call an epidemic curve. So it's just looking over time, the number of cases by week. And this chart stretches all the way back through kind of mid to late uh, 2021 to now. So it's really a full year's picture of the epidemic in Chicago. And really everything is dwarfed by this November, December peak um, and January peak of, that was really caused by Omicron BA1. So you can see orange here is Delta, which was the predominant variant before Omicron. And you can see when Omicron popped up first, that's that little purple line there, very quickly it became dominant. And that really drove this massive increase in cases in late 2021 and early 2022. Yeah, and so the reason we're pushing so hard on getting this new updated vaccine now is because it's a really good match to what we're seeing now. Uh, and getting this vaccine while the match is good hopefully will make it less likely that you're seeing some new variant emerge very, very quickly like we saw last winter. Right, Can I, and just yeah. on that as well, there's, there's lots of different ways a new variant can emerge, but one of the most common ways we see, a bit like Omicron and all these, everything after this purple line is an Omicron type, a type mm -hmm. of Omicron. It's just a sublineage of Omicron. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible when you see a really dominant lineage like this, like BA5, the, the next variant is going to be a sublineage of that one, another subdivide. And so even if there is another lineage, and it is different from what's circulating right now, by kind of updating your immunity and bookmarking it with the current, right. current vaccine, you're really giving yourself a head start even against future variants as they emerge. Exactly, exactly. So we've seen about 12%, about 20,000 Chicagoans under five get a first dose of vaccine, which I although it compares to about 5% nationally, so we're more than double the national average, is, is worrisome to me, honestly. Um, and while we're talking a lot about the updated COVID vaccine for everybody over the age of 12, I do want to remind folks that, you know, getting kids up to date is important. Where we are seeing outbreaks as we're back in preschools and kindergartens, these little ones, we're seeing outbreaks. Um, and, and getting vaccinated uh, helps. It, of course, does not completely prevent COVID, but it's super important for preventing severe COVID and it does decrease the risk even of getting infected. I wanted, you know, these are all on the website, but I wanted to just remind you, you know, since the Omicron variant became dominant in Chicago, um, unvaccinated individuals, about 50% more likely to get to, to be infected than people who were vaccinated. So yes, we've seen a lot of breakthrough infections. I had a breakthrough infection, as you know, in late August, um, but vaccine matters, even in terms of um, helping to prevent uh, infection at an individual level. But more importantly, where we're thinking about the population and not wanting to see new variants and, you know, and thinking about how do we protect each other, um, vaccine is partly about yourself, but it is also about your family, your community, and those at highest risk. If we look at um, hospitalizations, just since Omicron became dominant, um, unvaccinated folks three times as likely to be hospitalized as those who have had a booster. And we talked about this last week, but I think it's worth just reminding people. The red line here are Chicagoans who are unvaccinated, who had not received a vaccine. The light blue in the middle are Chicagoans who got their initial vaccine, were fully vaccinated, but hadn't had a booster. And the dark blue is the booster. And so this big peak in January, the Omicron surge we were just talking about most of that you can see by far the highest risk was in red folks who hadn't had a vaccine at all decreased the risk to get the first vaccine but that dark blue are people who were up to date with their boosters and you can see this dark blue all line all along if we can you know if there's a surge this fall or winter i want it to look like this blue line in chicago right, right. um and and that's why we focus it and deaths have the exact same pattern here right like so many of our deaths if you if you look back all the way to the beginning here this 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 compares to when vaccines started um, unvaccinated Chicagoans about six times more likely to die than those who have gotten a booster. But look at the, the vaccine line here is almost flat, right? And then when we get a booster in, that stays almost flat. I just don't want red line. And, I, and, and ideally, I don't want this light blue line. I want people up to date. Um, and, and it makes a difference at the population level. So they are here, the updated COVID-19 vaccines. We call them bivalent boosters. Um, bi as in two, because they are both a booster with the original, against the original um, COVID variant, as well as for the first time, it's the first time they've been updated, protection um, that is designed against, uh, to help protect against the Omicron BA4-5. So uh, everybody over the age of 12 um, who is eligible, as long as you completed your original vaccine back in the day, 
Uh, doesn't matter if you've had a booster since then, you should get this booster. Um, if it's been two months since your most recent vaccine, you should get it, everybody over the age 12. Uh, you can get flu and COVID. Um, you can get the infected at the same time, but the good news is you can also get the vaccine at the same time. So all of the city clinics uh, and many others are offering flu vaccines and the updated COVID booster. And I would encourage you um, to get them even in the same appointment if you would like to. This Saturday, uh, for example, our city colleges um, will be open 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We've got first doses, second doses, child vaccines, uh, updated bivalent boosters, flu shots, um, uh, come one, come all, Truman College, Malcolm X College. Uh, Walk-ins are welcome, but it's even better if you if you sign up with us in advance, chai.gov slash COVIDVAX. Everything is free um, uh, at, at these sites, and there are $50 incentives for first, second, and booster doses, um, as long as you've not already received $100, basically, from, um, from CDPH for I vaccine. Think, yes. And I think it's worth saying, just based on those lines that you were showing, mm -hmm. probably the single biggest thing you can do to protect your and it yourself from COVID is to get your first vaccine. That's right. That's so right. if you've never been vaccinated, it's still not too late. Those vaccines right. are available. They'll be there. You'll get fifty dollars. Like, and it's and it really is the biggest th it thing is. that you can do. Yep. After that, the next biggest thing you can do is get your boosters and stay up to date. So yeah. really important to do all of those things. But it's not too late to get your first vaccine. As exactly. Well, and even if one. you've had COVID, just to be clear, those 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 slides that we were showing that includes everybody, regardless of whether you've had a COVID infection. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason we promote these, we don't make any money off this, let me tell you. We spend a lot of money uh, making vaccine available um, because our goal is to protect Chicago. And our at-home program is also up and going strong. We'll bring you, if you, if it's a first or second dose, we'll bring it all over the city. For the updated um, booster, right now we're focused on uh, the zip codes on the bottom right. That um, If you live in that zip code, we'll bring anybody COVID vaccine in your house, no questions asked. The $50 gift cards are also available. Um, and then anybody over the age of 65 or anybody who is homebound across the whole city. And if grandma is eligible for a vaccine at home, we would be very happy to vaccinate grandma and the nine other people who live near grandma, uh, all in that same appointment, regardless of age. So Saturday, Sundays, Mondays and Tuesdays, um, we will bring vaccine to you. And so uh, any questions, uh, give us a call. We operate that number seven days a week. Isaac, I'll have you finish off just with um, a quick little bit more about wastewater and then we'll do questions. Sure, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about the wastewater monitoring program and show a few slides, but, um, really want to make sure that there's some time for discussion yeah. as well to answer kind of questions and, and your thoughts on it as well. The first thing to say is that we have pretty good information up on our website, um, on the CDPH website, that's chicago.gov, and then just Google wastewater surveillance and you'll find it. Um, and we have kind of general information about our wastewater surveillance mon monitoring system there, but we also have specific reports that are updated pretty much every month to show the latest data. Um, also, a really good resource if you're interested in this is the CDC website. They have a map of the entirety of the US and they kind of color the dots based on where the sampling is happening um, to, to, to give you a kind of heat map of similar to the ones that you showed of incidents across the US. And that's a really good resource. It's a bit tricky for Chicago because we're, you know, it's really set up to be national and we're just, we're a, we're a small site in terms of the national picture and we have lots of wastewater monitoring happening in our local jurisdiction. So all of the dots are kind of layered on top of each other. You really have to zoom in if you're going to have a look at that website, but it is worth having a look at. So really, there's just two things that I wanted to highlight first. One is where we're currently sampling and how that's how we're planning to make some changes to that. And then also to talk a little bit about how hard it is to analyze long term trends when we're constantly making improvements to this program. And I think those improvements are all worth it, but it does mean it's difficult and needs some extra interpretation when you look at it. So currently in Chicago, we as the Chicago Department of Public Health monitor seven sewer shed sites twice a week. So this covers around 25% of the population of Chicago is at least one catchment area in every single one of the healthy Chicago equity zones. Um, and you can see they're kind of spread around the city. Uh, they're all different sizes, which is one of the challenges we'll talk a little bit about. Um, some of them are bigger, some of them are you know, like up to 200,000 people. Some of them are really small, like 300,000 people, like 3,000 people. Um, so really varied in terms of size. But this gives us local data, and it obviously represents the people who are in that sewer shed, but we use it as a proxy to estimate what's happening to the people around them as well. So that's what we call a sentinel surveillance system. 
that's what's happening in the city of Chicago limits. And we can do this Sentinel system where we're not monitoring every single house because there's also this additional layer of monitoring happening in partnership with the Illinois Department of Public Health. So I wanted to give a big shout out to our colleagues there. So they monitor the wastewater treatment plants in the Chicago region. There's three main wastewater treatment plants, O'Brien, Stickney, and Calumet. And they cover, each of them covers over a million people. So when you think back to those very small sewer sheds that we're doing sometimes, 3,000 people, this is on a whole different scale. This is over a million people in every single wastewater treatment plant. Um, and these cover both Chicago residents and Cook County residents. So this map here on the right, the dotted line is just the city of Chicago limits. But the blue shading is these wastewater treatment plants. And you can see they include a lot of the suburbs as well. So we get everybody in the, sh the city monitored through the system. We just don't have the kind of resolution that we're getting from that local picture. So what we do is we layer the two together and we get both the big picture and the small picture. But you can really see when you put the two together in scale, the size of our waste of our sewer shed monitoring sites are so much smaller than those kind of millions of people that are monitored at the um, state and county level. So what we're planning to do is try and add in another layer of monitoring that is kind of somewhere between those two. So uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the weeds of how uh, how sewers work, and this is something that I've learned over the last kind of few months and or year or two. Um, but basically, sewers that are um, quite close to the street, quite close to the street level, are monitored by the Department of Water Management. And we're really fortunate to have exceptional colleagues in DWM, or the Department of Water Management, who've really been kind of national leaders in this and helping to set up this monitoring system at the local level. As the water flows deeper, more and more of those pipes flow into it. So the deeper the pipe, in general, the more households or the more people are surveilled by that pipe um, so um, or drained by that pipe. And eventually they get so deep they're looked after by the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District or MWRD who are also the people who run these wastewater treatment plants. So they run these pumping stations across Chicago that basically pumps the water up to the treatment plants for the treatment. And those pumping stations can, they're very deep, but they can uh, capture wastewater from hundreds of thousands of people. So this is another way to kind of give us somewhere between that. It's not a million people, including lots of people in the suburbs as well. It's still just Chicago residents, um, but it's a, a scale that's somewhere between the, the very large and the very small. So what we're planning to do at some point uh, this year, and we've um, been working with MWRD on this, uh, is to try and add in these pumping stations as an extra middle layer of surveillance um, to kind of give us big picture, middle picture, and little picture. And so that would be the, the blue, the yellow, and the orange, right? Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be these kind of like shaded sections here um, showing, you know, capturing from 50,000 people to 450,000 people. And so those are the three main layers of surveillance that we have for wastewater. But there's actually another one that we haven't really talked about here. We do monitor a couple of high risk facilities, so individual facilities around the city. Um, and that really helps local infection prevention control. So where there's um, a facility and you're really monitoring for specific cases and you're going to do an outbreak response, we do do a little bit of that um, in the city as well, but the, primarily for the monitoring across the entirety of the city population, we use this right. monitoring like system. Right, like we're doing some of this at O'Hare, recognizing there are international travelers. We're doing some of this at Cook County Jail in partnership with them, recognizing the need for very quick outbreak response, et cetera. Exactly. So, and then, so this is a change to the wastewater surveillance program. So I think it's gonna be beneficial. We're gonna get a better resolution of surveillance, but it also introduces challenges because what we really, get from wastewater surveillance is a trend. What's that's the most useful uh, metric that we get from wastewater surveillance. Is it higher this week than last week? Is it higher this month than last month? That trend is really what's valuable. The absolute individual one-off reading is not so valuable. It's really, you've got to look at this in the picture of, of time. And av as you add in new sites, you don't have the benefit of that trend data from the last two, two and a half years of COVID. So, that we have for some of these sites. So some of these, wait, these sewer shed sites in particular, we've been working with some of our academic partners through the Discovery Partners Institute. Um, they've been sampling there for you know, nearly two years now. So we have some really good longitudinal trend data. We don't have that if we start doing these new sites. So I think so it's, it's an, an area that's growing. It's yeah. an area that's growing. It's an area of improvement. And I think it's going to set us up better for the future. But it means it's harder to analyze in the past. The other, another thing that we've been doing in the wastewater surveillance system is improving constantly our lab methods. 
you know, COVID is new, so everything about COVID is new, including wastewater surveillance. And as you mentioned, our whole program, our whole lab-based surveillance program is new to the department. So we're improving constantly our lab-based surveillance me our lab methods with the University of Illinois at Chicago who do our lab testing for us. That also introduces some complexities because as we've added in some kind of enhancement reagents, that makes that means it's less, we're, we're more sensitive. We're able to pick up COVID where we couldn't pick it up before. It makes interpreting different trends over time even more difficult. So we do some complicated so, analyses to try and combine, yeah. So I, over the last two, year and a half, two years, what we've changed laboratories, we've changed PCR techniques hmm. so that we can do it at a like, at scale and do this repeatedly. We've changed different, um, we've changed this enhancement step, so we've added in uh, something to increase our sensitivity. We've also changed the type of sample we analyze. We've, from a grab sample to a more sample, which kind of analyzes uh, the wastewater over time. And now we're, add we're changing in some sites as well. So each of these different colored dots or different colored lines represents a different a change, a different type of, an of analytic approach, a different type of laboratory method. And I think every single one of these is an improvement but every single one of these makes it slightly more complicated to compare to the data from mm -hmm. before. So this data from September of 2020 is actually from a different laboratory at the UIC using a different lab method, mm -hmm. using a different sampling method to the data that we're seeing now. Yeah. So it makes it harder to compare today's reading to two years ago's reading. So we have a few things we do to try and correct this. We always overlap so that we, have, we can try and compare the two directly for a period of time. Um, but you can't do that for all eight different things you've tried to improve. So just to flag, these are some of the complexities. And as we're working through these, we're planning to make our data more publicly available so that people can kind of get access to these data sets and do some of these analyses as well themselves. All right, perfect. Um, and, you know, every week in the same way, we can, we can pull that off. Every week in the same way that we, um, that your team decides we're at a low, a medium, or a high risk for our variant surveillance, the clinical samples, you do the same thing for wastewater. So what yeah. are we at right now? Yeah, well right now we're at a medium level for wastewater surveillance. Yeah. And that is uh, the, the metric that we use for wastewater surveillance combines two key uh, kind of indicators from our monitoring system. So we have uh, both the absolute levels of COVID that we find in the wastewater. So when that's very, very high, uh, that gives us a kind of, that raises our concern. When it's very low, obviously it pushes down our concern. But the other thing we look at is the trend. So is it higher this week than it was last week? Is it higher this month than it was last month? And we kind of average things over time to look at the trend. And again, if it's increasing, that gives us an extra point of concern. If it's decreasing, that gives us an extra, that gives us a lower point of concern. And then we kind of average these all out across all of the different monitoring sites across the city to come up with one overall metric which places us this week at medium. We have been at high in kind of recent months. Um, and yeah, so we continue to monitor every week and that's kind of an average of all of our wastewater monitoring sites. All right, good. Um, so we'll take about the last 20 minutes or so and get your and get some of your questions. There's a number um, that have come in for you and me, and so we'll we'll take them sort of together. Sure. Um, just quickly, some vaccine things. Shanai from Twitter: Are there at-home childhood vaccination programs for homebound disabled kids? Yes. Anybody who lives in the city of Chicago, give us a call 312-746-4835 or go to chicago.gov slash at home um, and we will bring uh, first dose, second dose, boosters um, for uh, anybody who is homebound, child or adult, um, disabled or not. So yes, please, please take advantage of that. And even if we come to vaccinate, you know, your, your child, we would, we at the same time are very happy to, you know, bring the parents up to date with uh, COVID vaccines or any other siblings, etc. Um, okay, um, let's take um, Dr. Shaw on Twitter, given how full and strained our pediatric hospitals are, you can chime in too, will you A, update the city dashboard to track them separately, and B, reinstate the mask requirement in public schools to help reduce the number of kids getting sick? Okay, so I want you to understand a couple of things here. First of all, the way that we report out publicly um, does tend to be by disease, right? We show you the COVID numbers, the COVID hospitalization numbers every single day. 
we show you the MPV data and the MPV hospitalization numbers. There is a completely separate system that we also use every day to see how full are our hospitals. So whether or not people are getting, um, you know, whether it's COVID, no matter what it is, and right now we're seeing a lot of RSV, uh, we're seeing some other respiratory viruses, um, you know, a lot of kids right now being hospitalized broadly with some respiratory viruses, more, tra more traditional ones. Um, and so when we're reporting, for example, what percentage of beds are available, uh, that takes all of that into account. Um, and so um, we do, you know, really every day we're looking at what's happening with adult and pediatric hospitals, ICU capacity, what may need to happen there. So whether it's being driven by COVID or not, it is something that we that we follow. And on the second part about reinstating mask requirements. So I think what we're seeing a lot of right now when I talk to pediatricians and um, chime in who are, who are working in hospitals and, and even in ICUs. We have a lot of kids who didn't have a lot of exposure to right. germs, you know, for a couple of years here. Um, kids who weren't in school or kids who weren't in daycare. Uh, and they're, of course, you know, more masking than is occurring right now. And so we're seeing some of these kids see, like see those normal childhood infections um, right now in a way that they maybe hadn't for a couple of years. We know that wearing masks helps with this, but when we're thinking about a mask requirement, we're really thinking about um, a significant surge of something unusual uh, that is significantly putting, you know, large numbers of people at some risk. So, you know, you've heard me say that if we got into a major surge, we started threatening the healthcare system in Chicago, that would be the setting where we would think about mask requirements, but we wouldn't do something sort of, you know, if we were doing a mask requirement for COVID for the city, it would also apply to the schools. We wouldn't otherwise likely do that um, separately. And, you know, if you have concerns about your child and respiratory virus, you know, I would encourage your child to wear a mask. I would. But also make sure you're up to date with all your vaccines. Please, please. Right. Yeah. Chime I was in. just going to say the same. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of the viruses that are circulating now and increasing now are things that we didn't see for a couple of years because of COVID. Because there's, of course, less flu around when everybody's staying at home as well. So there, there were really quiet years for some of these childhood respiratory infections, but they are common respiratory infections normally, and so now they're recirculating and sometimes at higher levels than might be expected in, in years like this. And so very important to be up to date with your childhood immunizations. Um, and, and we're not seeing a lot of people, children included, hospitalized for COVID across the city. You showed those numbers at the start, very yeah. low numbers for hospitalizations and an extremely low number for hospitalizations of children with COVID as well. Yep. Um, Diaz Shin from Facebook, and we can tie in some more wastewater here. So uh, Diaz Shin says, I believe New York has issued an emergency over its polio outbreak, which it has. Are there concerns about this here? Should people be getting booster vaccines for it? Do you want to start with that? Yeah. The first thing to say for polio is to make sure that you have had your childhood immunizations. Yep. And there, in Chicago, that number is a pretty good number of Chicagoans have had their childhood vaccinations. More than 95% of, ch of Chicago residents have, are fully vaccinated against polio. That's not quite as true in some of the New York neighborhoods where they did see polio cases or, or environmental um, surveillance positives for polio. So um, there were certainly, uh, you know, some of those counties had really low rates of, of polio vaccination in their, in their populations, like 30s, 40s, 50 percent, not the kind of 95 percent plus that we're seeing in Chicago. So that's one thing that's on the reassuring column. But on the kind of less reassuring column is that this is a disease that in, is nearly eradicated. The world has worked really hard for decades to try and eradicate polio virus. I was actually at the World Health Organization in 2011 working with the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And, you know, there was real hope then it was going to be done in the next year or so. But I mean, it hasn't like, been done. Gone. Gone, like smallpox, like <laughs> yeah. nobody ever needs a vaccine again kind of yeah. level. Um, but there's been really persistent pockets in a few different countries. And what's concerning is that in the last year or so, there's been other places where polio is not normally picked up that it's been detected. Like New York. Like New York, like London. Yep. It's been detected in environmental surveillance. There's been some outbreaks in other areas. Um, so it is worrying that there's kind of more of this popping up. And, and to some extent it's expected because COVID-19 interrupted so many programs, including these kind of regular um, monthly or, or every six monthly or whatever it is, national immunization days in countries where polio was circulating. So there is to some extent going to be some expected kind of detections around the world, but it definitely is concerning that it's here in the US. And, and so we are working, we have been working with CDC and other jurisdictions for the last month or so to learn more about wastewater monitoring 
and how we can apply some of that wastewater monitoring in Chicago, especially when there's kind of detections in places where there's strong travel links like po like New York or like London. Right. So that's something we're working on. It's something we plan to start having more information on in the coming weeks. Um, the lab is with all of these things. You know, there's uh, we talked about how long it's we've been improving the COVID wastewater surveillance program. With all of these things, there's a bit of lab setup time. We've got to get reagents. We've got to test things. We've got to make sure we're giving accurate data. Um, but the plan is very much to start kind of building these capabilities to do poliovirus testing locally as well. Um, probably just when there's uh, signals that indicates we might need to do that, like now. Um, but yeah, certainly an, uh, a concerning sign in New York. Yes, and there's no recommendation at this point to get a booster vaccine for polio. Um, if you had all of your regular childhood vaccines, this is one of the vaccines that's you know required for school, et cetera. Um, you don't need to do anything further, but uh, it's just a good example of a disease that we've barely had to worry about. Uh, and, and now our, there's a lot of conversation um, about it. So make sure, you know, if, you're, if you got your childhood vaccines, if your kids are up to date with their vaccines, not a significant concern. Um, but, but if there are uh, kids or adults who are unvaccinated, I, I would have some concern right now. And I, you know, even here, even though it's not detected, this is different than what, we, you know, talking about polio in the U.S. is not something we've done in decades uh, in a serious way. And so um, get, up, get up to date with those vaccines and adults can, can also come up to date. Um, and if you're traveling, especially if you're traveling to anywhere that has sort of ongoing polio, it's critical that you're up to date with your with your vaccine. All right. Um, so Alexandria Deanne on Facebook says, I saw a headline. This is we kind of addressed this already that hospitals in the area are seeing a rise in kids being hospitalized for respiratory illnesses. It seems early for this. What do you think's behind it? Should we be worried for fall or winter? Yeah, I think that really relates to what we were saying about um, some of the interruption in the normal cycles of these respiratory viruses that happened with COVID. So we've, we've seen this a few times with different viruses, um, with flu, with RSV, but the usual seasonal patterns of it increasing in the winter and decreasing in the summer have been a little skewed because of how few people got these infections during COVID. So definitely concerning, definitely something that's being watched very closely. Um, I think, again, the really important thing is to get up to date with your childhood immunizations. A lot of these vaccinations can protect your kid from these from severe outcomes from these mm -hmm. infections and so really important to get up to date not only with your covid vaccines but also with all of your childhood routine immunizations that that many people had difficulties making and keeping appointments during covid but now is the time to get caught up yeah and cdph has been working you know with cps and other schools on uh getting kids up to date you know as they're coming back into school um, Eliz on Twitter says, every day we hear of more places removing COVID vaccine mandates. Uh, one example today was New Zealand. What are plans for Chicago or Cook County or Illinois? And are we tracking bivalent booster uptake or not? So to take the second part of your question first, yes, of course, we're tracking bivalent booster uptake. Um, I showed you right at the outset, you know, those numbers that are peaking up, those are largely bivalent boosters. Uh, we're planning to, we'll have our kind of vaccine website um, updated probably over the next week or so. Um, but yes, we are tracking it. We're seeing some nice early uptake. There is plenty of vaccine available. There's a couple comments here. Um, Chicago got about 150,000 doses allocated to us just in that first week. We got another 50,000 allocated after that. So you should not have difficulty finding a vaccine. Um, and uh, about the COVID vaccine mandates. So there are places that had vaccine mandates um, uh, you know, to do lots of things like in cities. There was a point, if you remember, in Chicago during Omicron, because our hospitals were getting so full and the most of those folks were unvaccinated that we did have for a short period a vaccine requirement for high risk settings like bars and restaurants, um, et cetera. We do not have a citywide vaccine requirement at this point. Um, City of Chicago employees, you know, are required to get that original vaccine, um, you know, to be vaccinated against COVID unless they have uh, an exemption. Um, but that's that's the employer. Um, and many employers, of course, have done that. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking then related to kind of the COVID vaccine mandates, but we are in full support of employers um, deciding that there are certain settings where vaccines are required, certain health care settings. Um, but broadly speaking, there is not a COVID vaccine requirement in place for the city of Chicago. Uh, but we do, of course, like, you know, please get that updated booster. Um, so 
there's a question. What actions are taken when a sample shows evidence of a COVID increase in wastewater? I think it's really important to note for wastewater surveillance, particularly, it's never the sole indicator we look at. We never just look at our wastewater surveillance data and make public health decisions on that. It's even for um, other diseases like uh, polio, for example, it's not the gold standard of surveillance. The gold standard is still looking for a case, finding that case, responding to that case. So it's never the only or gold standard form of surveillance. It's an extra piece of information. So what we do is um, we have lots of kind of local partners that we work with across the city uh, who do things like vaccination, who offer testing, et cetera, um, who have strong links to the community, who can do communications. And when we see lots of different metrics trending in the same direction, we'll often have community meetings to try and work with people to, uh, so that the people who are in, living in that area are aware of the increased concern, have easy access to all of these um, mitigation measures like vaccinations, like testing. Um, we have rapid tests that we distribute, for example, specifically to community areas when we see triggers. So it's not that there's a specific action tied to one wastewater surveillance um, number. You know, we don't shut areas down of the city just because we find COVID in the wastewater or anything like that. It's much more, it's part of the full picture. There's a analogy that people talk about in disease surveillance that there's an elephant and everybody's blindfolded mm -hmm. and everybody's got a different piece of the elephant and you're feeling the foot <laughs> and it feels like a column and you're feeling the tail and it feels like a brush and you know you're feeling the trunk and it feels like a slide or whatever it is and it's only when you put all of those pieces together do you understand the full elephant of surveillance and so wastewater surveillance is just one piece of information that we one pixel that we add in to understand the full picture of what's going on in Chicago all right good um, so we're just about at time here let's take there's a quick one from Lisa Marie Walsh on Facebook. Uh, she asked for initial vaccination series for children six months and older. If you started your series and got COVID in between doses, how long do you wait to continue the series? If it's been more than 28 days, do you need to start the series over? So first of all, I always encourage anybody who's got questions like that, ask your pediatrician, ask your doctor, because this is dependent on whether, you know, does your child have certain underlying conditions? Are there concerns, etc. You definitely do not need to start ever um, at least ever for COVID, you do not need to start over in terms of uh, COVID vaccine. So if you got a first dose, kids, adults, anybody, if you got a first dose and for whatever reason you didn't get your second dose, you can get your second dose now and it would count you know, as a second dose. I think generally um, CDC has also made the recommendation that you do not need to wait to get a second vaccine or a booster. Some there may be settings in which you decide to wait, which is where you know you can check with the pediatrician. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, even for this this most recent updated uh, updated vaccine that we're really excited about, and we want everybody over the age of 12 to get, um, as long as it's been two months since their most recent vaccine, we um, definitely are saying that you you know you can get that regardless of, of whether you've had boosters before but they say that if you've recently had covid you don't have to wait and so if people have underlying conditions um or you know whatever it may be there may be a setting where you say i want to go ahead and get it even if i just recently had covid There's, that's not dangerous in any way just to be clear um but if you've just recently had covid like i did in late august the cdc says you can wait up to three months um to get that updated booster but if I start to see the variants changing or a major shortage, I'll get it sooner than that. So, um, you know, for your child, I would say go ahead and get that second dose. I probably wouldn't wait, honestly. I'd want to get those initial vaccines done. Um, and you do not need to start series over for kids or adults. Just to add two small points to that. One is wait until you're no longer infectious. Yes. So make sure Good if you point. have COVID, wait your infectious period out as soon as you've completed yeah. your isolation period, then go and get your vaccine. Yeah. The other thing to say is, so a, a related question I think we get a lot is, um, you know, what happens if I missed my, um, my second dose by a week? Or, you know, I've missed the appointment and now I can't get another one for two weeks. That's no problem. And actually the UK, deliberately spaced out yep. vaccines more. You can space them out more if, if you want to. It's just a minimum time period that is given by CDC for the kind of first and second doses. So um, definitely uh, speak to your individual provider, but but don't, if you miss an appointment and you're worried about 
kind of being outside of the strict schedule, don't worry too much about that. Just get it as soon as you can. Just get your updates. Exactly. Vaccine. Same thing for MPV. You don't have to start over if it's been more than 28 days. Just go get your second dose. Yep. So, um, all right. I think the last question that we'll take is from Francie Swidler on Facebook. Um, she asks, are there any COVID symptoms we should watch out for as we go into the fall and winter? Will symptoms differ at all from the spring and summer? You want to start it off? Sure. There's actually um, been some interesting work. You know, we see a lot of things happening with the virus changing. You know, Omicron and its sublineages is an example of the virus changing a bit. And there are indications that different lineages of the virus can cause slightly different symptoms. Um, but the overall thing to say is that broadly, COVID looks pretty similar to how it always has done. You had it recently, I had it over the summer as well. Um, you know, you get uh, congestion, you get a runny nose, you get a cough, you get a sore throat. I felt rubbish, I had a fever, um, you know, fever and chills, you can have a loss of taste and smell. Um, there are some indications, for example, with Omicron, the loss of taste and smell is less common mm -hmm. than it was with some of the earlier lineages. All of this is also um, impacted probably by the fact that many more people are vaccinated than they were before. So your, your kind of background immunity is different. So certainly the severity of symptoms if you're vaccinated is much less. Um, the ver severity of symptoms if you're boosted is even less. So that can kind of change how it looks a little bit. But broadly, COVID looks like a lot of other respiratory viruses. It causes a lot of similar symptoms. There's maybe some slight changes across the population level with some new lineages. But if you have a cough, if you have a runny nose, if you have a fever, if you have loss of taste and smell, and smell get yourself tested. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're protecting others around you and not exposing themselves to them to COVID. Um, so get a test early. Rapid tests are available widely across the city. Um, make sure you get tested if you have any symptoms. It's just a really important way to protect yourself and others as we head into fall and winter. Yeah, and that, the at-home tests are fine. You can use those, um, have them available. So thank you so much for joining. I will tell you that when I am out and about in Chicago, I am getting asked lots of questions about um, COVID boosters and especially about timing. So I wanna just underscore uh, that I would encourage you to get this updated COVID vaccine really now. Please don't wait until December. Please don't think if there's a surge, I'll do it. Right now is when the match is good. Um, the safety of the vaccine is good. The efficacy of the vaccine is good. And we want Chicago to, you know, get through whatever is coming with as little, um, you know, as little burden as possible. And somebody this morning said, you know, is this like the flu? Is this not like the flu? You know, you were saying it isn't like the flu, but it seems like this is changing like the flu. What is this? So COVID is very similar to flu in that it spreads through similar ways, more or less. It mutates and creates new variants and strains, just like flu does. It can impact. It's not going anywhere. Um, but the problem is, is that COVID is still so much more likely to cause severe outcomes. So we have, you know, depending where you look and which subgroup you look at, you know, 10 times the likelihood uh, in some of these groups of being hospitalized or dying with a COVID infection than influenza. But that's partly because we've had 100 years of immunity experience, like as a population um, with influenza. We've had shots, we've had recovery from infections. And so we don't know like for sure what the future holds, um, but I am very confident that we are going to be living with COVID probably for, for some time, unless there's a significant breakthrough. Um, and, and the updated vaccine, yes, it may be an annual thing, just like it is for flu. Um, but but getting, getting those vaccines is your most important step and get the one now. The match couldn't be better. We've never had a flu vaccine um, be matched as well uh, to the flu strains as the current, you know, the updated Omicron vaccine is to um, is to the, the Omicron variant. So um, this is Dr. Isaac and I, uh, just one of the excellent people who helps um, me and the whole Chicago Department of Public Health make sure we stay on top of COVID and really all infectious diseases. Um, I know this was a lot of science for us today uh, in terms of the wastewater, but I, we get a lot of questions on it. The people who are, you know, who are watching tend to be tend to be pretty interested. So thanks for all your good questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to pass on my thanks to some of the team. Um, we're actually losing one of our key colleagues on wastewater surveillance, Justin Hart, who's been integral to setting up our 
a wastewater surveillance system who's going on to do a PhD, which is great for him. We're hiring at the same time, so we've got new great people starting as well. Um, but just really all thanks to Justin and everybody who's worked on this wastewater surveillance project. Absolutely. We will be back um, regular time next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Um, I'm currently planning to have uh, Dr. Wilnice Jasmine from CDPH uh, and Dr. Nikki Gastela from um, the state super program, um, substance use uh, prevention and recovery. She also does um, substance use treatment. And they were supposed to come earlier and I had COVID. So we're trying for a reschedule this coming Tuesday. Um, we will, of course, do the infectious disease updates as well. So uh, thanks for your attention and your questions. Um, and please stay safe and talk to everybody you know about coming up to date with updated COVID vaccines. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.